introduce you to Patrick and John Collison, the founders of a payments company in Silicon Valley called Stripe. Um, I want to start out actually by asking the audience, uh, how many of you have a sibling? Um, how many of you would actually willingly found not one but two companies with your sibling? <laughs> It, it, numbers dwindle. Yeah. <laughs> um, was there ever a question that you would found these companies together? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it definitely wasn't a, well, I guess I speak for myself. Maybe John can reveal how he's been thinking about this for all along. But um, uh, for, for me, it wasn't that I sort of particularly wanted to uh, start a company with my sibling, uh, no offense. Um, but uh, I mean, I guess you want to start a company with uh, sort of wh whoever uh, whoever you uh, you know you, you think sort of might make the best co-founder, um, and uh, John seemed to be that. Um, he's he's a pretty sharp guy, um, uh, but um, I think that anyway, I I, I think that I, I see some companies where sort of people start it with someone they know really well, but who isn't actually sort of especially well suited to it. And I think that sort of often doesn't go well. I think when the uh, you know, the, the sibling or, or whoever it might be, maybe your best friend, um, uh, sort of is actually also really qualified for it. I think it's actually really good because when you know somebody for sort of you know, a decade or decades, um, you have sort of this advantage of you've gotten through sort of all the, the conflict resolution um, in that you know, uh, John and I have been doing conflict resolution since we were three and five and <laughs> you know, our, our strategies for resolving Fighting conflict over the yeah. have, have evolved a little bit, so no, that's yeah. good. Uh, describe to me briefly, what does Stripe do? Sure. So uh, Stripe is a software platform for building internet businesses. Uh, and you know, we, we started off with payments, but I even what we're doing for, for businesses now today is expanding. Uh, I, I think the opportunity that Patrick and I saw when we started out, you know, th this was a problem that we very much came to uh, as potential customers, right? We had built uh, web apps, we had built mobile apps before, and always, you know, invariably the hardest thing was just kind of charging customers, accepting money, and turning a product into a business. Uh, and you know, we didn't really do very advanced, you know, addressable market calculations or anything like this. But we did know a lot of other entrepreneurs, a lot of other people who are building internet businesses, and their experience was the exact same. And so. What we set out to do was, you know, up to then, everything, you know, all your options were provided by merchant banks and PayPal and things like this. There was no one who was actually building a payments platform for the developers, the people who were actually building the businesses and understood their concerns. Uh, and so that's what, you know, the, the first version of Stripe we pitched as payments for developers. It was, you know, the things that you needed. I want to go back to that pitch because uh, your, one of your first investors is actually Peter Thiel, who was the former CEO of PayPal and, of course, led that company for a number of years. Uh, what was that pitch like? You know, basically, you're, you're pitching yeah. the disruption of the company he helped, he helped build. Right. It, it, it was sort of a, a, a kind of weird pitch because um, uh, you, you, you go meet Peter, and he's obviously sort of preceded by the reputation um, and everything else. And so the, there's kind of uh, you know, some expectations going in, which are not just pitching him on, uh, you know, some, well, th s some idea unrelated to his background. You're in fact telling him that um, his baby is ugly, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and and so you know, the, a very big part of the thesis of Stripe uh, was that sort of everything that had come before, and there were sort of two primary strands. There was all this kind of finance industry legacy stuff. And then there was sort of PayPal, which we thought had made fundamentally the wrong bet. They had kind of bet on owning the consumer relationship rather than on the developer and building developer infrastructure. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, weren't exactly sure sort of uh, uh, how Peter would react to this. Um, and actually, you know, really to his credit, like I, I'm not sure uh, I would be able to be this way if, if I were in his shoes, but uh, he, he was super into it. Um, and so he, he was our kind of first major uh, uh, angel investor. Um, and, uh, and sort of in, in, you know, he's now invested, I think, in every subsequent Stripe round, uh, and I've, I kind of asked him a couple of years later sort of how he thought about it, and of course, Peter being the, um, sort of the, uh, the, the extreme contrarian, said that you know, it, <laughs> he, uh, it was because it was completely opposed to how he had viewed the world, he thought it therefore was a good thing to invest in. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not every uh, former PayPal, you know, member of the PayPal mafia decided to invest in you. I mean, 
uh, tell me about the one that actually said no. Yeah, so, um, so uh, Max and Elon uh, also invested uh, pretty early on. Um, but then we, uh, we met with Keith Raboy. Uh, and uh, he, Keith was actually really helpful. Um, he made all these intros for us. Uh, and I, those actually ended up being quite significant for the business. Uh, uh, it led to our first kind of major banking deal. Um, but he also told us the idea wouldn't work. Uh, and uh, still made the intros um, and d declined to invest. And actually subsequently uh, uh, went to work at Square. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, so, so that didn't quite work out. But then I think three years later, um, and again, I'm not sure I'd, I'd be able to sort of uh, you deal, know, with it. <laughs> deal with it, uh, but uh, uh, he, uh, he participated in our Series C. Did um, he say he so, was sorry? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think that's exactly yeah. Keith's style. <laughs> Um, so let's flash forward to the present. Uh, you are now, Stripe is now powering um, the infrastructure for a number of buy buttons uh, from Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, of course, um, not powering for Google, but Google just announced their own sort of version of the buy button today. Uh, which one of these partners do you think has the most success with this particular technology? They're all our favorite partners. <laughs> uh, but. No, I mean, I think they all uh, are, are solving slightly independent problems. They're solving problems for their own user base. What, you know, what, what, to take Pinterest, say, what, what they're doing is the fact that uh, before, Pinterest has so much purchase intent, and the experience of actually acting on that, you know, if you're collecting things that you want to buy, going from the, you know, the Pinterest app, Ben was talking about how much of Pinterest usage is on mobile, and then if you actually go to, you know, do something with all the stuff you've pinned. You know, you click into the retailer's website and it's loads slowly in Safari and it's kind of janky and it doesn't really work and then you click through seven. Actually, you don't do all this because you just give up halfway through, right? And so they want to make Pinterest work really well for, for, for people. One of the main things people want to do is kind of collect things that they're interested in. Uh, and so the buy button from a product perspective makes, makes total sense. And I think part of this idea with Stripe is that you should not have, you know, you should not have to go build out everything yourself from scratch. Uh, Stripe should give you all this infrastructure of doing something that, in a way, is pretty complex, right? If you look at buy buttons, you're in a, you know, helping other merchants accept payments, and you're doing so on iOS and Android and maybe web, and there's all this complexity that ties into it. Uh, and you know, we are not trying to insert you know, Stripe into it. It's not the Stripe buy button. You know, we're not developing a mobile wallet. Uh, what we're doing is helping you know, Pinterest or helping Twitter make a really awesome experience for their customers. And pushing them to the forefront. Why, why are they picking you? Why are they picking Stripe and not PayPal or some of these other companies? I, I think it sort of comes back to this sort of core aspect of the strategy where sort of uh, we're, we're building developer infrastructure. We're building the tools and the APIs that enable things like this. We're not focused on owning and defining the consumer experience. Actually, I was going to just kind of jump off on what John said. I think there's actually, you know, if I can be, you know, for giving a quick digression, and um, there's actually something going on here that's sort of uh, you know, much bigger than than even just something in commerce or payments, right? I think it's kind of a bigger secular shift where, um, when you think about just kind of user experiences on mobile devices, it's um, it's it's much more costly to follow a hyperlink, basically. It's more costly to sort of to shift contexts. When you're on desktop, you can go and you can sort of, you know, command click on a link and it opens in a new tab or something. So if you can multitask, you, you can shift between different places. On mobile, that that's, you know, it's slower, it's more com complicated, it doesn't work as well. And so what you're seeing across all of these apps is people trying to sort of, um, to flatten the funnel so that everything is right there at the point of at the point of entry at the point of discovery. It's and broader so, than just commerce. Well, well exactly. And so, kind of concretely, I mean, if if you look at uh, say Snapchat Discover, that's sort of getting the content right there up into the app so that you don't have to go elsewhere. Or if you look at uh, you know Facebook Instant Articles, it's, it's the same deal. And so I think what you're kind of inevitably going to see happen uh, in mobile apps is that similarly, uh, not it's not just the content that's going to be so directly integrated, but the purchases will be too. I think the best example of this, because you can actually put numbers to it, is you know when Facebook solved mobile, a big part of that was uh, mobile app install ads. And you could advertise mobile apps before they had the native app install ad. But what it did was it took three steps where you know you click on a link and you go out to a page and it brings you to the iTunes download page or whatever. So there's a button for like download the app right there. And that massively increased the, the value of the ad space for Facebook. It, 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 it hugely increased their CPMs just by kind of compressing the funnel into the app. And, and so I think if you, um, 
again, if you just think about how this almost inevitably has to play out, I think sort of the point of purchase is going to move from being on the merchant's site to being kind of directly in the app, this kind of idea of federated commerce uh, where you sort of un untangle and separate those for the first time. And so I guess, you know, to your question, so sort of why all these apps have been, uh, or these companies have been choosing Stripe versus something else, it's because we've been building APIs to support this. Do you think that people are gonna have any buy button fatigue um, there's any I think the media will have buy button fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think consumers are going to think of it as 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 uh, you know a strategy or something, right? They're just going to be, oh, awesome! I don't have to go to this random site and you know follow seven different steps, t tapping in my card details. Like I, I can just sort of perform the action in a single step and. You know, it, it's just going to seem like the natural thing. The, the apps that don't have this are going to seem broken by comparison. Yeah. Another big partner uh, for, for you guys is Apple. Uh, and, and you had a big win um, last fall when you were chosen as like a preferred partner for Apple Pay, their, their payments product. Uh, tell me about how that's going and what are you seeing in terms of traction with users actually paying with Apple Pay? So we have a ton of merchants integrating. Uh, you know, there is actually technical integration, so you're seeing it gradually rolling out across apps. Like with the in-person component, because it was bootstrapping off the existing contactless readers, you could use a lot of stuff you know, out of the box. Whereas with apps, people actually have to go and integrate it. But with some of the people who are integrating, we're seeing really cool early traction where uh, you know, uh, we have a few merchants where already a majority of their, of their payments on iOS are coming via Apple Pay. And like, it's only on the iPhone 6 and above, so, so, so that's really cool So you're cool seeing stuff. more traction uh, within the apps versus in stores? Well, well yeah, because our, 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 kind of, our wheelhouse is almost entirely the in-app stuff uh, rather, than, rather than point of sale. But uh, yeah, so seeing really awesome traction for, for kind of the apps that are early adopters of it. And honestly, I think like a majority of your tran transactions coming through Apple Pay, like you, I don't think we've seen that with any mobile wallet before as well. You know, mobile wallets are always, you know, trying to inch up with the, you know, one, two, three percent market share in the little NASCAR thing. Whereas Apple Pay has very quickly established itself as the, as the default. And you can see why, right? You know, the experience of entering in all your details manually versus being able to just authenticate with the, the touch ID sensor. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think inevitably, to be honest, uh, it's not just Apple Pay, pay but uh, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, in most, uh, it, the, the device manufacturers and the platform owners have such a huge advantage here that I think uh, uh, Android Pay, Apple Pay, whatever else is kind of built in by the platform, it's basically inevitable that that wins because, I mean, they have the OS integration. You can't compete with sort of that, that little sheet that, that, uh, that pops up, the integration with Touch ID, the integration sort of with the point of sale. It, it's, yeah. uh, it's just the, the OS is going to win here. Yeah. Uh, I want to just open it up to some questions. I, we have one right in the front. I just want to say, I think that what you guys have done is, is brilliant, but you've short shrifted it because it's not just apps. You've created an API architecture. I, frankly, I don't understand why the other PayPal people didn't appreciate that, that the API, the, that's the point of leverage. What is it that you understand about a suite, managing a portfolio of APIs that other organizations don't? Because that's the gateway, not just for payment, but it facilitates the technical compression, the latencies, all, that, and you get to learn what apps, how people take advantage of these for your next generation. So there's actually a point that I think is uh, is really important. I mean, I, I, uh, I think there's a, a, a lot of uh, backporting of, of vision and of insight that goes on in Silicon Valley. So, you know, I think the correct thing to do would be to say, you know, well, when we started, we always thought that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but actually, I, I think it's, you know, something that we, we happened into by virtue of, of our background and the genesis of the idea. Patrick and I are both software developers. I mean, the, you know, the early photos of Stripe are us, you know, Patrick and John on laptops, you know, in a basement, and Patrick and John on laptops in a, in a cafe, um, and just hacking away. And I, th I think what, we have all this kind of un understood as developers, but like uh, doesn't quite get through to a lot of executive suites, is how important the APIs and the uh, technical tools are for businesses that are in motion. Uh, because, I mean, if your business is completely static, Stripe mightn't be that interesting to you. If you've got it all figured out, uh, then you know, maybe you don't have that much need for Stripe. These are, these are uh, well, but, but then, you know, if you're starting out and you're rapidly building and you're expanding internationally and you're building an iOS app, 
the speed at which you can bring all that stuff to market and you can create you know, those customer payment experiences, that's really freaking important. And, and what we're seeing is that that's not just a thing that startups or high tech companies care about. I mean, you go talk to any large company and their speed of iteration and innovation is like the most important thing on their agenda. And so we're seeing all these cool use cases now where like Walmart building products on Stripe, uh, Open Table launched, it's super cool. They launched Uber for restaurants and so you know, within the Open Table app you can you know, pay for your meal and leave without. I heard a rumor that uh, a number of presidential campaigns are using Stripe. Uh, Clinton, Rubio, uh, Scott Walker, Jeb Bush, the DNC, and the RNC. Is that, that correct? That is true. Um, and um, What about uh, Trump? Uh, <laughs> I don't think he'll be raising a lot of uh, uh, grassroots donations. But, um, <laughs> plus, we're not called Trump payments. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, no, I, mean, I, I think that's, that's directly relevant. Actually, to your point, I mean, I'm super into the, um, the API architecture stuff. I think it, it really matters. Unfortunately, people tend to. I can to attest to this. He's a huge <laughs> programming language nerd. Uh, p p p the, the audit, it doesn't quite resonate, it seems, with the audience when I go into like, the importance of you know, solving latency issues. And honestly, I think one of the coolest things we do is how we handle API versioning. Um, so stuff doesn't break um, uh, as we sort of, it, it enables us to roll out new ver versions faster without uh, old versions breaking, um, uh, which in turn sort of uh, increases that innovation clock cycle. But anyway, I, I won't bore you guys with the details. But, but to your point though. Um, innovation clock cycle, I love it, I'm gonna start using that. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, I think presidential campaigns are, are basically a form of startup and they're actually a really, ni really nice kind of you know, microcosm or something where they're so intent on having the right purchase experiences and be able to sort of react to changes, you know, in, in their strategy, changes in the market, new devices, new platforms, whatever. Like, they can't afford to miss a beat or be behind for a month. And so, yeah, I think basically uh, all of them decided to build on Stripe. All these campaigns want to build a best-in-class donation architecture over the course of the next you know, year, year and a half, and then it'll evaporate. Uh, and not only that, but as they're doing this, the world will be changing around them where, you know, Apple Pay just came out, Android Pay, you know, they'll want to integrate that, uh, all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, w w when you care about speed of developing this over the next 18 months, I think that's, that's what we end up pitching, and I think it really resonates. Adam. Three quick questions, and the, the first two, I think if you can answer them, you'll help me finally understand Stripe. I didn't so, know you were allowed to ask three questions. Well, I'm gonna be really quick okay. about them, and, and Lena will make sure that you answer all, all three. Um, what is the, um, the non-mobile world analog to Stripe? Why does Apple Pay need you at all? Why don't they just do it? Um, and then my third question, you had a throwaway line at the very beginning that you've moved beyond payments. Uh, I know nothing about this. I hope you could, I wish you could elaborate on that. Um, God, I don't even know what order to take those in. Uh, so uh, to, the, um, to the Apple Pay question, what Apple Pay is really solving and solves phenomenally well, and I think actually, you know, one of the things I most respect about Apple is how they can you know, enter a new industry that they haven't you know, previously played in, you know, whether it be music or in this case, whether it be payments, and take their kind of Apple-like lens of consumer experience uh, and, and really good architecture to it. And so in the case of Apple Pay, it is really nice security properties and the, the customer experience is amazing where they're using the combination of you know, hardware and software, the touch ID sensor to authenticate the payment. But what they're doing is the, you know, the payment identity piece. So just like when you go into a store and swipe your card, that Magstripe gets across who you are. What Apple is doing is getting across who you are to the merchant. But then the merchant actually needs a way to kind of charge the card, run their business. Uh, they're probably going to be running it across web and Android and, uh, and iOS devices. And so you know, there will be fairly few merchants for whom Apple Pay will be the whole thing. And running their business will be even more complex than just Apple Pay. You know, they might be running a subscription business. Uh, and, and that kind of gets to the point of you know, your third question, which is beyond payments. I mean, if you look at these subscription businesses, uh, they're really interesting, but all the ones before Stripe, you know, they would get their merchant account and they would plug in a gateway, you know, they'd do all the payment stuff, and then they would have a few people full time writing code just for the billing and customer system, in that you need to store customer profiles and keep track of what, who's on what plan and decide who you should try to upsell on the next plan and handle prorations and downgrades and then deal with all the customers that are, you know, have had failed payments. And so you end up building this internal 
edifice, and, and it's really just, you know, it's like people building their own email system. It makes no sense. And so, you know, if, uh, another example is, say, the on-demand companies, right? Yeah. Yes, they need to sort of charge customers. They also need to figure out how to, to pay to their vendors or their contractors or employees or whatever the case might be. They need to figure out sort of how they can roll this out in multiple countries and to figure out sort of how to track the balances between them and maybe they have sort of marketing incentives or they want to sort of, uh, you know, give discounts at particular times. And sort of, it's not just about sort of the consumer paying, it's about sort of coordinating this, this kind of much larger, you know, ecosystem marketplace in their cases. And so depending on the business model, there's a, you know, okay, fine, the, the sort of, the credit card payment is kind of the foundational component, but then depending on the business, there are all these kind of additional functions that have to happen uh, sort of on top of that. And so, to, to, uh, that, yeah. that need APIs. And so, to your first question, uh, although you know, I think it kind of answers the third as well, I think the best sort of analogy for Stripe is AWS, uh, where you start out with, um, with kind of the really basic hosting layer, and once you have that, now there's all these kind of really obvious, valuable kind of adjacent services, you know, CDNs, backup, security, whatever the case may be. I have a be. question for you on that, though, because uh, AWS has made a good business out of not only uh, computing power, but also attaching a bunch of services on top of that. Is that sort of your so, bigger so, strategy? So we, we sort of have been attaching all these services uh, uh, on top, and there's kind of really high uptake uh, uh, on those services kind of across the portfolio. The difference between us and AWS is we don't charge for them separately, and we don't brand them as separate products. Um, uh, or kind of, like with AWS, it's kind of, it's very segmented. This is kind of actually part of the Amazon organizational philosophy, that they're all sort of these discrete services that, that kind of connect together. Uh, we, we think, uh, and this is, partially because of the domain where it's sort of, everything needs to be very nicely integrated, that it should be sort of largely a cohesive whole. And this comes back to your API design question and how you sort of get that right. Um, but I mean, whatever, leaving the kind of- the innovation clock cycle. <laughs> <laughs> leaving, the, um, leaving the kind of business question aside of how you charge for it, yeah, I, th I think it's, it's kind of, uh, it's, it, it's almost exactly the same thing in the sense that hosting is the foundational component for EC2, uh, payments is the foundational component for Stripe, and then with that you build these additional services. Would you happen. eventually charge, or is that out of the question? It, it's certainly not out of the or question. Would you charge? It's just all integrated. Right, would you eventually then segment out the, some of these services? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, on, honestly, we, we look at that as sort of, that, that's not for us a kind of a, a macro strategic question, it's a pretty tactical kind of pricing question, and we think it's simpler to just like, charge for the payment and you know that's more than enough to sort of fund these additional services maybe for some particular service p perhaps if there were sort of really high costs associated with running it it might make sense but uh, we like the simplicity of the current model stripe's been valued uh, reportedly at five billion dollars and, and you guys are uh, reportedly raising another round of funding is that true I definitely read some of those rumors in the paper <laughs> <laughs> no comment no comment. So if you were to raise that round of funding, just <laughs> this, no, this imaginary round of funding, what would you use it for? Fund the innovation clock cycle, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, 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 well, I guess the two big things for us right now are um, uh, building out these additional services, right? Uh, in that there, there is a lot that's kind of in the pipeline, uh, and so just kind of uh, enabling that. Luckily, that's not sort of super capital intensive, uh, even though it's really important. Um, uh, and actually, it's we great partnered for us with that Alipay. It's, um, uh, I guess it's, you know, the, it's frustrating uh, for all the these you biggest know, larger systems in China, can't just hundreds of millions right? of active um, uh, and the other one and all these you know, folks in China who weren't uh, able to buy uh, from a different you know, ways, right? All, all these not enabling uh, sort of consumers uh, uh, businesses in the US or in Europe and so forth. And we thought it was just you know such an insane kind of. I don't know, inefficiency in the internet, right? That you have literally hundreds of millions of people in China with sort of, with an online payment credential, but which can't be used outside of China. Uh, and so, and it, we went and did this deal um, uh, to sort of a, as a first step towards fixing that, but we don't obviously just want to do it in China or just with, with Alipay, we want to do it across the world. And then the, kind of the second side of that is enabling businesses in all these different countries. And so yeah. Stripe is available yeah. when, in. China is a big market, of course. Um, when will you start allowing merchants in China to use Stripe? TBD. Um, we uh, were sort of uh, we we announced our uh, beta in Japan um, back about uh, I guess it's two months ago at this point. Mexico is uh, in beta. Uh, uh, Mexico just went into beta. We've sort of uh, uh, another Asian market uh, coming up in the pipeline, uh, and so you know f for us it's uh, sort of it's always a balance between kind of the complexity of the market and the size of the market. Um, uh, China is obviously you know 
because we're sort of in the in the financial space and you know touch on questions of like currency control and capital controls and so forth, it's kind of one of the more complicated ones. But uh, you know, definitely high on the on the priority list as I guess kind of the Alipay deal um, was was you know, and, and uh, to Patrick's first step to Patrick's Alipay point, I think this is one of the things that one we are personally most excited about, but two we think is the big, one of the biggest opportunities uh, for Stripe. The fact that the web is so broken when it comes to money right now that you know literally before this we did this Alipay thing, you know consumers in China could not buy from sites in the West, uh, and, and you know the, the, the we you know this edge in the graph is is now filled in, but the graph is still very incomplete. So you know you, you have the internet a way to seamlessly move packets of information around, but when it comes to money, it's, you know, it all flows within national boundaries, more or less. Uh, and, you know, Im imagine an email system where you could only email people within the United States. I mean, it, it, it seems ludicrous to say that, but we've, we've somehow accepted that it's the way it is for, for money. Uh, and, you know, Stripe was founded on the idea that, you know, internet businesses are really different to offline businesses, and you can't just, you know, like the merchant banks did, graft your offline offerings onto the internet. And so part of this is, you know, the API arc architecture that we've been talking about at length. But another part is that all online businesses are global from day one. You know, they're addressing this global audience. They can choose to limit it if they want, but by default, they're reaching anyone on the internet. Yeah, uh, and you know, part of the sort of Stripe thesis is obviously that uh, sort of you know, the rise of developers and the fact that sort of most of the important internet companies are yet to be built. Um, but another part of it, and I think, you know, as a society, this has sort of become, uh, uh, We've kind of retreated a little bit from this idea over the last decade or so, but Stripe is absolutely just a bet on globalization. Like we think it's good, we think more of it uh, should happen, we think more of it is going to happen, and that sort of like the promise of the internet is that sort of uh, it's kind of a transcendence over physical geography. You know, it shouldn't matter uh, which country you're in, um, and we just kind of haven't really delivered on that promise yet. Do uh, you uh, do you think about an IPO? I mean, your valuation's growing, and there's got to be some thought about it. Not really, um, in that uh, I, I think it sort of comes down to a, a question of sort of the, the stage of the business. Um, and so if you just kind of look at sort of Stripe size relative to the size of the overall market, which is so gargantuan, and then if you look at sort of the amount of offline commerce that you know, is going to move online, that has moved on online over the last couple of years, one of my favorite stats is it, it's a little bit difficult to count because uh, of sort of the um, uh, you know, definitive figures are, are difficult to come by here, but in and around two or three percent of consumer spending globally takes place on the internet today. And so if you kind of think about that figure, you know, the idea that maybe 98, 97 percent doesn't, but then you think about sort of how you spend or your cohort spends or what that's likely to look like in five or ten years, like the, the shift is just so massive, right? And so, uh, you know, our More than two percent are on their phones right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so. You know, our, our focus is on sort of figuring out uh, uh, how to navigate that uh, and how to sort of accelerate that shift uh, to, you know, to the internet, uh, how, to, how to do it in these different countries. I think w once the business reaches maturity, then that's probably the time to sort of think about you know, returning capital or an IPO or whatever the case might be. But we think we're, we're sort of uh, uh, you know, a long way from hitting kind of the plateau of that sigmoid. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.